Immanuel Kant, revered by some, despised by others, but recognized as great by all who know. Kant thought that the mind, like these hands Escher group, literally constructs itself. Kant's way to his theory was by David Hume. Kant couldn't sleep at night because Hume had proven that if one reasoned strictly from experience of the senses, we couldn't know anything metaphysically deep about the self, death, or the world as a whole. And we couldn't even know anything about causality, the glue of the universe. This is because, if we look at our immediate sensory experience, we find that it is impossible to see these supposed metaphysical realities. This especially peeved Kant. Isaac Newton seemed to have described causality at work with his laws of motion and gravitation, but according to Hume, science could be nothing more than a useful custom. Heroically, Kant resolved to rescue Newton while simultaneously finding a place for the self and its freedom in nature. The rescue plan begins with raw experience. And raw experience is something like a Jackson Pollock. Kant calls it intuition. It is what is given immediately in consciousness. But taking only what is immediately given in experience and excluding everything else just gives us a meaningless mess. And this was precisely Hume's mistake. Experience is hardly ever like a Jackson Pollock. And that's because we use concepts to make sense of our intuitions. We need to, for as Kant says, intuitions without concepts are blind. Intuitions need concepts, and concepts are rules. The power of using rules is called understanding. But rules on their own can understand nothing. Concepts without intuitions are empty. To give content to our conceptual thought and sight to our raw intuition, we must use rules to understand our sensual receptivity as a unified perspective of the world. This work of conceptual unification Kant calls synthesis, and it is affected by judgment. We judge that properties and relations belong to objects in space and time. Kant thinks of judgment as a free act of the human will. It is through judgment that I not only make up my mind, but I make my mind. But I can only judge if I have already submitted to the rule of twelve super-concepts. Called the categories, they are unity, plurality, totality, reality, negation, limitation, substance, causality, reciprocity, possibility, existence, necessity. It is impossible to think outside the box that these concepts form, for the box is the mind itself. Even the relation each of us has to our very own selves is only possible because we have become under the sway of the categories. Thus we stand to our own selves as we would any other object in the external world. We seem fated to treat each other and our own selves as mere things. Kant's argument against Hume turns on the idea that the categories are no mere limitation to the mind but the condition of its possibility. Without always already being totally involved with objects, I cannot even begin to be skeptical about my relation to them. And so, we are led to say, in all seriousness, with Martin Heidegger, that the truth of the being of beings is revealed in a pair of shoes painted by Van Gogh. Our will to truth, if we have one, impels us to impose our rationality upon our sensuality by subsuming our intuitions under concepts. This establishes the intentional subject-object relation, which is the essential structure of the mind. But how does my body fit into this picture? Doesn't my body ground my consciousness at a level deeper than any language games I might play? It may be contradictory to think of the mind as imprisoned by the rules that constitute it, but it also seems inevitable to think of the passions of the body as at odds with the rules of reason. And below these rules, deep in the subconscious, we know there lies the logic of the heart. Kant's picture of the mind is, for the lack of a better word, schizophrenic. Thinking is divided against feeling, action is severed from passion, and law takes precedence over emotion. To be human is to suffer from a particular sort of multiple personality disorder. But as is usually the case with Kant, a seeming limitation is quickly shown to be the source of a great freedom. The schism of the self is produced by self-consciousness and visions of what might be. In moments of self-consciousness, we distance ourselves from the self we are to decide the self we are going to become. Because this is an activity that we must perform through time, we are compelled to say that the self that determines is the same self that is determined we are always determining ourselves to determine ourselves. This is what it means to be free in the natural world. 
Immanuel Kant, despised by some, revered by others, but recognized as great by all who know. I give Kant the last word. If we look upon the sum of all knowledge of pure speculative reason as an edifice for which we have at least the idea within ourselves, it can be said that in the transcendental doctrine of elements, we have made an estimate of the materials, and have determined for what sort of edifice, and for what height and strength the building may suffice. We have found, indeed, that although we had contemplated building a tower which should reach to the heavens, the supply of material suffices only for a dwelling house, just sufficiently commodious for the business on the level of experience, and just sufficiently high to allow of our overlooking it.